I'm Jamie Baldwin Fergus. Um, I'm a visual ecologist. I study how animals see and interact with the world around them. My project here focuses on the variety of visual adaptations found in high period amphipods uh, to the deep pelagic habitat. So let's start with the pelagic habitat. This would be the open ocean away from land um, and away from the bottom. In the top few hundred meters, the water is blue, giving way to pitch black. After a thousand meters, uh, the only source of visible light is bioluminescence. Animals that live in the pelagic are unlikely to encounter physical objects except other animals. Uh, the dim light and lack of structure have led to a bit of an arms race in the pelagic where animals are struggling to see without being seen. And this has generated a number of fascinating morphological adaptations in both the eyes and bodies of pelagic inhabitants. The hyperiod amphipods are among the most interesting groups in terms of visual adaptations. Hyperiods are small to medium crustaceans, living almost exclusive, exclusively pelagic. There are 233 species worldwide found between shallow waters and very deep trenches. Generally, a hyperiod will have one pair of large eyes occupying a large amount of the body, as shown here in Hyperia macrocephala. The eyes have crystalline facets that focus light onto a darker retina below. And while this may be the so-called typical eye of high period amphipods, there are many, many other arrangements. In very deep living species, the eyes are often reduced or even absent. And in Lanceola, its eyes are reduced to one pair near the anterior end. In another deep living species, Scypholanceola, the eyes are modified into four mirrored pigment cups, where on each side of the head there is a photopigment layer divided by mirrored portions of the exoskeleton that presumably aid in light collection. Up a little higher in the so-called twilight zone, the eyes undergo various modifications balancing vision with camouflage. Here in Cystosoma, the eyes are modified to be nearly transparent. The retina is very thin and diffuse. It's that orange layer you see. This allows for the transmission of downwelling light, reducing the silhouette produced by the animal below. In Phronema, the eyes are very large and have fiber optic cables connecting the facets to four compact retinas. One pair of eyes looks upward while another looks out to the side. The fiber optic cables allow the eye to be large while maintaining a relatively small visible retina. Paraphrenema has some of the strangest apposition compound eyes known. It also has fiber optic cables connecting facets to receptors, but instead of having a single retina for each eye, there are 12 retinas in each eye. And the retinas are those orange clumps. Streetsia is more of a shallow species, and it's a cyclops. Its once paired eyes are now fused into a conical structure with about 2,500 facets and seeing not quite 360 degrees around. It can't see in front or behind itself, only circumferentially. In looking at the questions, why do hyperiods have such a variety of visual adaptations to the deep pelagic, and what are the mechanisms shaping these adaptations, we're taking an integrative approach. We are, of course, looking at vision physiology, but we're also looking at the optical habitat of each species and the eco ecological interactions of each species. Combining information from these areas allows us to make some predictions about what each species might be doing and what the eyes are specifically adapted for. Uh, I've been spending a great deal of time trying to figure out uh, the vision in Paraphrenema gracilis. Like I said, it's got a unique eye with 12 retinal clusters in each of the dorsally directed eyes. Most apposition compound eyes have a single retina. Um, so I've, I've been doing a little histology, and I've measured facets, crystalline cones, and rhabdoms, and I've estimated the spatial resolution to be between 2 and 3 degrees. Human vision is about 0 0.07 degrees, so if we saw 2 to 3 degrees, it'd be like looking at a very blurry, pixelated image. But they have a light gathering power or light sensitivity much greater than humans. Um, their sensitivity is between 10 and 40 microns squared per steridian. Um, this is comparable to other midwater animals or other crepuscular or nocturnal animals. Now, I suspect that there may be spatial summation occurring within each retinal cluster, and this would reduce their spatial resolution to about 15 to 25 degrees, meaning they probably couldn't form an image, but the trade-off would be the light sensitivity would be increased by a factor of 1 or 2,000, 
and in deep waters where light is scarce, this trade-off may be beneficial. A large part of my project also involves working on a special microscope built for microspectrophotometry. It's a setup that allows me to measure the color of light absorbed by an animal's photoreceptors. I've graphed here the spectral absorbances in red of five species that I've recently studied. The smooth black line is a rhodopsin template that we fit our data to to determine the peak sensitivity. Spectral sensitivity varies between 480 nanometers, which is basically blue light, to 520 nanometers, almost green light. And spectral sensitivity can tell us a little bit about the light the animal is most interested in, whether they're searching above or horizontally, whether they're focused on a specific bioluminescence output. And studying things like spectral sensitivity and spatial resolution can help us piece together ecological information about each species. Our findings will later be analyzed in regards to a recent high period phylogeny. We will map visual characters like eye type and spectral sensitivity, as well as depth profiles and symbiotic relationships onto the tree to compare visual traits among species. Can I take any questions? And their diet? Yeah. <laughs> what do we understand so far about these eye types and their diet? And the answer to that is not very little. So there's almost no information. There's very little information on the diet. I mean, we have information on their predators. We have information on their hosts. Very little information on diet. So you think it may be more associated with predator avoidance? I think it could be a bit associated with predator avoidance. Um, they're preyed upon by myctophids, so other mesopelagic fish. But I think a lot of it has to do with the particular hosts that they associate with. They're usually found on various um, jellyfish and, and, and other gelata in the deep. So I think a, a large part has to do with which particular host they're looking for. Thank you. <laughs>